Thank you. Lo siento, no falo portugués, and so I'll be doing this presentation in English. Um, but thank you all for coming to learn about BitVM. And uh, before we get started, I would like to tell you all what a hash function is, because we will be using them uh, a lot during this presentation. So, uh, does, did anyone here bring their kid? Did anyone have a, bring a child with them, or, or their son or daughter? I don't see anyone who did. Well, let's just imagine uh, that someone brought their son or daughter, and they were standing right next to me right here. Uh, if you have a child, your DNA contributes to the DNA of your child. And if you have both the parent and the child together, you can actually check if they're related by doing a paternity test. We can do the same thing with data, and that's called a hash function. You can take a piece of data, run it through a hash function, and it will produce a little child. And if you have both the parent and the child, you can check if they are, if that one is a parent, uh, if the child is a child of that parent. Uh, and so that's what a cryptographic hash function is. We'll be using them a lot during this presentation, so just be aware of that. Um, if you change the DNA of the parent, the child's DNA changes too. Same with data. If you run different data through a cryptographic hash function, you will get a different piece of data as a result. All right, so now that we know what hash functions are, let's talk about Bits, Booleans, and Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar Galactica is a television show from the United States. I've never seen it, but I always like to imagine that it's like Galaga, which is a video game from the United States that I have played. So I imagine it's just that, but live action. Uh, but I'm gonna show you how to make uh, video games and make them work on Bitcoin using bits and Booleans. Sound like fun? Let's get into it. Uh, we're gonna go over what BitVM is, what it can and can't do, talk about some of its limitations. Uh, and we're going to go over Boolean circuits, which are just amazing. I fell in love with them when I found them. Uh, we're gonna show how to put them into Bitcoin addresses. And then, since that doesn't do everything we need, I'm gonna tell you how to do the rest, which is using hash locks and taproot to finish out uh, this whole thing. All right. So what BitVM is, BitVM is essentially a computer, a virtual computer. If you've ever played with um, VirtualBox, you might know what a virtual computer is. Sometimes you're running uh, your computer and uh, let's say you have a Windows device, uh, but there's an application that you wanna use that's only available on a Mac. I don't know, maybe it's like um, ProCut Pro or the Final Cut Pro that's only a Mac-only uh, software. So if you can't run it on your Windows machine, what you might be able to do is open up something like VirtualBox, which is virtual machine software, uh, put the Mac operating system on there, and tell your Windows device, hey, pretend to be a Mac. And it'll put a little virtual computer in a window on your computer, and you can run Mac programs in there. Well, that's what BitVM is. It's a virtual machine that we figured out how to make, and that what's neat about it is uh, it works with Bitcoin. Uh, you can actually have, you can run a program in BitVM and have Bitcoin understand uh, what this program is doing, the output of this program, and then use it uh, in a Bitcoin contract to say something like, you can only spend this money if you complete a level of doom, for example. So stuff like that. Uh, okay, so that's what BitVM is. It's a virtual computer. It can run programs. You can run programs in it. Uh, but it's programs uniquely, you can put them in Bitcoin addresses, and Bitcoin can actually validate or invalidate whatever happened in that program. BitVM programs typically run off-chain. Uh, it is, although, it, although you can run them on Bitcoin, it is silly to do so because they're very, it's very expensive. It would take a lot of transactions to do it. So normally what you do is you and a, someone else uh, create a Bitcoin address together. You put money into it. The Bitcoin address encodes the program, but you don't run it on chain. That would take too many transactions. Instead, you both run it off chain. You both run the program on your local computer's virtual machine. And once you've run it, you can see the results. And only and if you agree on the result, if you say, yeah, he won the level of doom or whatever, no problem, nothing needs to happen on Bitcoin, uh, you just send him his money. Uh, if you disagree, if you say, well, according to my program, if you put those controls in, uh, it, result, it, me it means you get killed by the monsters, uh, so you didn't win, then you have a dispute. And that's when you go to Bitcoin, you say, hey, resolve this dispute for us. So rather than run the entire thing on Bitcoin, you just run the parts where you disagree on what happened. And that saves a lot of space, makes it a lot more uh, efficient. Uh, if a party runs it wrong, they lose sats because the code is also in a Bitcoin address. Bitcoin understands these programs, so you can actually take someone's money if they don't run the program right. And that's really cool. You can do a whole lot of stuff with a program that uh, Bitcoin can understand 
and, uh, and basically running an entire computer, an entire virtual machine with any program you want inside of it. Uh, it's really neat and it's a lot of fun to make these things. So let's talk about how it works. Um, this is a little sample for those of you who want to understand a kind of a high level of what it looks like when you're using BitVM. We've got two people here. We've got Paul on the left, uh, my, yeah, your left, and Vicky on the right. And uh, they're going to make a Bitcoin address together. So this Bitcoin BitVM address has an addition program in it. Addition's real easy. We can do that. Vicky's over there. She's like, yeah, we both funded it together. Both of our money is in there. And we both checked the code so we know what it's supposed to do. So there's the Bitcoin address. Next thing that happens, oh no, Paul asserts that one plus one equals three. Well, that's not right. So Vicky says, okay, if you're going to say that, send me bit commitments. I'll get into what bit commitments are a little bit later in this presentation. Um, but they are uh, a representation of that number, of the numbers that he's putting into his program in binary. So he's going to send her the binary digits, that's one and one, and then the last number there, I know it looks like an 11, but it's actually three, because binary is weird. Uh, and she says, hey, that doesn't look right. Here's the program. This is, this is called a logical circuit. This is what I'm going to tell you about later, too. She says, this program is in our Bitcoin address, and I can tell when I run one and one through that program, it doesn't come out as three. And there's a big red X where it fails. It's actually an addition program, and that's actually where it fails. I actually did the circuit. It's fun. Um, so she says, this doesn't work. And then Bob, or Paul says, rats, you caught me. He can't deny it. He gave her the bit commitments. She ran them through the program. Bitcoin, even Bitcoin knows that doesn't make three. So she can prove the error on Bitcoin and take his money. And yay, good for her. She was, she was vigilant and made sure that he wasn't able to do something wrong. So that's how BitVM works. Like, that's what you'd experience as a user. Um, but I want to give you more technical details and show you how you can actually write programs uh, that use this thing uh, and give you more of a high level, or lower level understanding of what we're doing. Is everyone with me so far? Does everyone see kind of the, the general outline of what BitVM is doing? Cool, good. So let's keep moving forward. What can BitVM do? Well, not much currently. I've got the only implementation of it that currently works, and I've only written three functions for this, for this computer programming environment. One of the difficult things about making a new computer is it starts out pretty empty. People have to write programs for it, and uh, I'm the only one who's done it. So I've written an addition function for it, a comparison function that can take two numbers and check um, which one's bigger. And I've made a program that can count uh, zeros, or actually it can just check if a string you give it is composed entirely of zeros with no other characters in it. And it'll give you a true or false based on that. So those are the functions that BitVM can currently do, and it's not very much. Uh, we need, I, I would, I'm in the process of writing more functions for it, and some of my friends on Telegram are writing functions for it too so we can increase what BitVM can do. Currently, it can do those three things. In theory, it is a perfectly valid computer that can run any program. So if somebody writes it for it, you can run it. I mentioned Doom earlier. We got people working on it. We're going to make Doom run on Bitcoin, or off Bitcoin, actually, and then just check whether you won or lost on Bitcoin. But in theory, yeah, you can run any program on it, and that's really great. I see a path to do three main things, things that I really want to see in Bitcoin. Uh, one of them is any two-player game. I would really love to see chess done on Bitcoin, where Bitcoin's actually validating the rules of chess. That'd be a lot of fun. Something called bonded covenants. Uh, covenants are a type of transaction in Bitcoin where uh, you put some money in an address, and once it's in that address, it can only go to a pre-specified destination. Uh, sometimes we call it cursed Bitcoins. Put some Bitcoin in an address. Once it's in there, it has to go to Alice. 100% uh, of the money has to go to Alice. Or your covenant might say, yeah, 50% of it has to go to Alice, but 50% of it has to go to Bob. These are covenants. It's like a restriction that says once it goes into address A, it has to go to the pre-specified list of other addresses after that. We can't really do real covenants, or at least I don't see how we can do real covenants with BitVM. But we might be able to do bonded covenants, where you could have Bob uh, basically run a Bitcoin wallet in the BitVM, and uh, the program would say, uh, you have to, the, the Bitcoin address has to give me a valid signature that sends the money to such and such address. And so if he doesn't produce that, if, the, if he can't produce that uh, transaction using the Bitcoin wallet in BitVM, he would lose money. And that's called a bonded covenant. It's not the same as a real covenant. A real covenant is unbreakable, uh, and the rules of Bitcoin would enforce it. This would be like a monetarily enforced one, where he has to make this transaction sending the money to Alice, otherwise he loses money to Vicky. Uh, and then we could maybe do optimistic sidechains. 
Side chains are um, a, a, a construct in Bitcoin where you create an alternative blockchain, you put Bitcoins onto it, uh, you use them there for a while, maybe you make some money, maybe you lose some money, when you're done, you take whatever you have left and you go back into real Bitcoin. Uh, with BitVM, we could maybe make better federations. Uh, currently, we use federated side chains in Bitcoin where you have like 15 people, you send your money to this group of 15 and they get to vote. You know, when you're done, when you're done using the side chain, you ask for your money back and they vote on whether to give it to you. We could maybe do better with um, BitVM and make it so you would only have to trust like one person in that group. As long as one person is honest, uh, you, then you could get your money back. So those are three improvements to what we can do today in Bitcoin. And uh, I would like to, I see a path to making those using BitVM. So those are some of the things that I will be working on uh, as, as we move forward with this thing. Some of BitVM's limitations, what it can't do. Uh, BitVM contracts need at least two parties to be involved, a prover and a verifier. It would be great if we could get rid of that. It would be great if we could just make Bitcoin addresses where you know, Paul puts some money and then he has to run a computer program and if he doesn't do it, he can't get his money out. That'd be great and we can kind of do it, but we need Vicky. We need Vicky to be involved to check that he did or didn't do the work. Uh, and as long as you get Vicky involved, then we're good, but it would be great if we could get rid of her. Nothing against Vicky, but she ruins everything. Uh, BitVM contracts also need interactive setup and execution. The fact that you need at least two people to be involved makes them kind of a challenge. You gotta, you gotta get two people together, they've gotta exchange signatures, they've gotta do a bunch of off-chain computation together, and it's some work. It'd be great if you didn't have to do that. It'd be great if you could just have Paul make an address, put some money in it, and be done, but that's not how it works. Bonded covenants can be broken for a high price. You know, I talked earlier about how these are incentivized monetarily, so if you made a BitVM address that says you have to use a Bitcoin wallet in this BitVM, send money to her or him or whoever, and if you don't, you're going to lose some money. Well, that's not, that's not enforced by Bitcoin's rules. It's just enforced by BitVM, and BitVM only enforces it through monetary considerations. So if you really didn't want to send the money to whoever he said he was going to do it, uh, he could just not, and that person wouldn't get the money. But instead, Vicky would. She would be able to slash him. So uh, yeah, bonded covenants are not the same, and they're not as good as real covenants. But they might be useful in certain scenarios. I think you could improve lightning with them, and I think you could make Arc easier to build with bonded covenants. So, I still want them, even though they're not perfect. Another couple of limitations. If you, make, if you use this to make an optimistic sidechain, you know, Ethereum uses optimistic sidechains all the time. They, they've been experimenting with them for a long time over there, and they have some downsides. Uh, one of them is that you need to trust at least one person. We talk about Vicky the verifier, right? You can have Vicky be multiple people. You can have like 10 Vickies, but if you're not part of the group of Vicky, you've got to trust somebody in there to make sure Paul is running the program correctly. Because if none of the Vickies say, yeah, here's the proof he did something wrong, then he can get away with anything. Um, but it can be you. This is what often they say this in Ethereum where they use these side chains. They're like, hey, these aren't perfectly trustless. Um, you have to trust somebody to verify whatever the prover is doing. Same thing here, but it can be you. You can be one of the Vickies. And then you don't have to trust anyone but yourself uh, with ensuring that, the, that Paul does things correctly. So an example of this would be like uh, if you made a sidechain and the prover was like, here's the latest state of the sidechain, here's the latest blocks, here's, here's my proof that I'm doing everything correctly, uh, here's my proofs that if someone wants to withdraw from the sidechain, I'm giving them their money. Those would be the kinds of things the prover would need to do, and at least one verifier would need to check and make sure that it was all correct. And uh, if, the, if it was something was wrong, if he was like, didn't let somebody out of the sidechain, or if he made a block incorrectly, at least one verifier would need to supply that proof so that he can get punished for not running the chain correctly. Um, so that's a, that's a downside. These aren't, these things, BitVM doesn't give us perfectly trustless side chains. It doesn't give us drive chains, um, but it gives us something better than what we have today, or at least I think I, I think I can make something better than what we have today. So uh, that's what I want to use it for, and I hope I get help, so, so it's not just me. Um, another downside is that very large programs, uh, if they went to chain, if you had to dispute them, they could get very expensive. Um, I talked about how you only, go, you only go over the parts where you disagree uh, when you run this stuff on Bitcoin. But if you disagree on a lot, uh, if, if it takes you a long time to find your disagreement, uh, you could be looking at 10, 15 transactions for a really big program uh, to find your area of disagreement. And that could be really expensive. So uh, you could lose money if you don't take account of that and you put in like $50 into a contract that would take $100 to prove somebody wrong in, that would be a dumb idea. So that's a downside. It could be very expensive if you use a really big program. Like if you 
tried to run the entire Linux operating system or something on BitVM, uh, and then someone did something wrong in there, you could end up paying a lot of money to prove that they did something wrong. Um, so small programs are best. Use, use it for small things like chess. That's like barely anything. Uh, a mining pool with a hash rate majority can steal from BitVM. Uh, so this is a big problem. We don't have a solution for this. Uh, but basically, we, it's, it's a similar thing with Lightning, where if you're in a Lightning channel with someone and they cheat, if they broadcast old state, you have, to, you have to prove they did that. You have to create a transaction on Bitcoin that contains the proof that they broadcasted old state. You have to do the same thing with BitVM. Uh, if, if they cheat, if they run the program wrong, you have to broadcast a transaction proving their error. And miners can just not mine it. They can just censor it and say, we're not going to put that in the blockchain. And if it doesn't get in the blockchain within, before its time lock expires, uh, you're ruined. You, you didn't make, your proof didn't make it in. And so the, the, the bad guy, Paul, he got, he got away with whatever it was he did wrong. Um, so he can collude with miners to just say, hey, I, I wasn't able to beat Doom, but I want you to just not, when she shows that I didn't beat Doom, don't mine that transaction. Uh, that way I get the money and I will split it with you. And so miners can do that. They can just not mine these transactions and then steal. Um, but as long as Bitcoin's working, as long as Bitcoin uh, doesn't, as long as miners aren't colluding to, do, to be dishonest, uh, then BitVM works very well. So those are some limitations of BitVM. And uh, now I want to go into how we actually got BitVM to work in Bitcoin. And to do that, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, computers and Boolean circuits, which are so cool. So uh, this is a very basic computer. We've got a battery over here that's got some charge in it, and we've got something called an AND gate. This is a logical gate, logical circuit that we use in computer programming. Well, only at the very low level we use them. But computer scientists in here, you guys know what this is. And you guys are probably shaking in your seats because you're so excited to see an AND gate live on screen. But these things are amazing. How do they work? Well, first of all, we're going to take a wire from our little battery here. And the wire is red because there's no electricity flowing through it. A wire needs to be connected from a, a source of positive charge to a source of negative charge because electrons love to go from a place of high voltage to low. And in order to do that, they've got to travel a long uh, path. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our wire, which is currently red. It's got no electricity flowing through it. There's no circuit. And we're going to connect it to the bottom of the battery where the negatively charged part is. And the electrons are going to flow there because that's what they love to do. They love to go from the area of high charge to the area of low charge. So we got a live wire now, and anything we, any wire we connect to this wire will also have electricity flowing through it. What we do is we're going to connect one of the wires on our AND gate to this, uh, to this wire right here. And you know what happens? Nothing. Because that's what an AND gate does. It's got two input wires right here. One is green right now, and the other one's red. And it will only um, send forward the charge. It will only send that electricity forward if both of the wires have charge flowing through them. So we can make it glow, we can make it all live if we connect both wires to it. That is called an AND gate. You need to have the first wire and the second wire both be connected in order for the electricity to continue flowing. There are other logic gates. This is the AND gate. We represent electricity using ones and zeros when we're analyzing these figures. If both of them are one, then and only then will the output be one. It'll send forward the electricity. We have an OR gate. In an OR gate, you just need one of them. So if this one is on, then it'll be one. If this one is on, it'll be one. If they're both on, it'll be one. It'll send forward the electricity. Up here, we've got an exclusive OR gate. With an exclusive OR gate, uh, it, it will, it's pretty much the same as an OR, except uh, the last condition doesn't apply. It, it, only, only one of them needs to be on, and if they're both on, it won't, it won't send forward the electricity. So that is an OR gate. Uh, it's pretty much the same, but if they're both, the difference is if, they're both, if both wires are connected, uh, then it won't send forward the charge. It'll say no. It has to be exclusive. Only one of them can be on at a time. Uh, then we've got the NAND gate, which is the most powerful of the, uh, of the logic gates because it can simulate any of them. You can just connect a bunch of NAND gates together and make any program. Um, but this one will uh, only, sh only allow electricity to flow forward if both of the input wires are zero. Uh, it's a magical one where it can produce electricity from nothing. Actually, it's just got a direct connection to your battery. But whatever, the NAND gate's awesome because you can use it to simulate anything. If either of these were a one, if either wire was connected to the battery, then that would become a zero. It, like, inverts everything. NAND gates are awesome. So those are some of the logic gates, and these are what we use, or what I use when I'm writing BitVM programs, to create circuits. Um, so 
This is an example program called addition. This is going to add two numbers together. It's got an AND gate hooked up to an XOR gate. And we read the result in binary. So we have two input wires over here. We can connect one or both of them to the uh, hot wire, to the battery. And the result we're going to get is, in binary, a readout of how many wires are connected. So if we connect just the first one, then it will flow into the AND gate. But what does the AND gate say? It says, oh, both of these need to be on. Otherwise, I won't give you a result. So it's just saying zero on that other end. But the exclusive OR gate is also connected to this. The exclusive OR gate says, I'll do it if, as long as just one of them is on, it'll go through. So we get the result, zero, one, which in binary, that's the number one. It's saying only one wire is connected to the battery. We can also do the same thing over here. If we plug the other wire in, but keep, keep the first one out, uh, the same thing happens. The AND gate won't fire, because it wants both, but the XOR gate will, because it only needs one. So whether, whether you connect the first wire or the second wire, the sum you get is still one. You've got one wire connected. Then the other thing you can do is you can connect both of them. And if you do that, the AND gate will fire, because AND wants both of them to be connected, but the exclusive OR gate will not. It says, hey, only one's allowed to be connected. So it'll say zero. Now in binary, you've got the number one zero, which I know that sounds like 10, but binary's weird, and binary, that's two. So this is how you can actually make calculators, using just electricity and controlling how they flow. So the neat thing about BitVM is we figured out how to do this. Any program, any program you can think of, whether it's Doom, whether it's Ethereum, any program you've ever written, even Bitcoin itself, is just a really complicated set of these things uh, hooked all together, a really complicated set of logic gates that control the flow of electricity to light up different pixels on your screen and make it say you received money or you didn't receive money or you won Doom or whatever. Computers are just this. This is all they are. If we can do this in Bitcoin, we can do anything in Bitcoin. So this is an 8-bit adder. These things get, I have this here to show you that they get very complicated. Uh, this is just a very simple program that's adding eight ones together. And you can get, uh, you can see how many, um, see what the result is of uh, adding up to, that, uh, up to that amount. But as you can see, it's a really complicated circuit. You know, you've got your battery over here. It's got to be connected to all these different wires so it can give you a result and tell you how many of them are connected to the battery. That's a really complicated thing, and it might start to look a little bit like a microchip, like a very small microchip. That might look like a schematic for one. Here is a real microchip. If you take the microchip out of your computer, out of your laptop, this is an Intel microchip, and you take off this little metal plate right there, this is what you would see. This is, this is what an Intel microchip looks like. If you zoom into it, you're just going to take this section of that microchip and zoom in all the way down. That is what a NAND gate looks like under a microscope, like one of these logic gates. And I show this to illustrate that your computer, all it is is millions and millions of these things, about 100 million, hooked together to make a very complicated circuit that can do, you know, that can run Doom, or that can run anything. The point is, this, all this is is a really complicated version of that, of that circuit I showed you earlier. So if we can do the really simple one in Bitcoin, we can also do the really complex one. We can run an entire computer chip, even an Intel microprocessor, right directly on Bitcoin. So it's, it's really cool. That's, that's what we're building with BitVM. It'll take us a while, because there's millions of things we have to hook together, but we can do it. Like, Intel did it. We can do it too. OK, so how do we get these things into Bitcoin? I want to show you how we do that by uh, breaking down what a Bitcoin transaction looks like. This is a Bitcoin transaction. This is what the blockchain is made of. You've probably never seen a transaction that looks like this, even if you've gone onto a block explorer, because they, they take everything apart and make it human readable, or at least somewhat human readable. But uh, this is what the blockchain looks like. It's just a bunch of those stacked up on top of one another, every single transaction. I took this transaction from a book by um, uh, Andreas Antonopoulos called Mastering Bitcoin. Uh, it's available for free online. He made it available for free. Uh, and he color codes it and shows you what each part of a transaction does. And he helps you write computer programs that can create Bitcoin transactions. I encourage you to look at that uh, if you want to know more about how Bitcoin transactions work. But I want to focus on a few things. And in order to give you just an overview of a Bitcoin transaction, uh, this number right here, the, the number one, tells you how many um, Bitcoin addresses contributed to this transaction, how many from addresses are involved here. There's only one. We're spending from one address, uh, and we're spending to two uh, new addresses. That's indicated down here. This number two indicates that you're sending money from one address to two uh, new addresses. 
this is the amount for the first address you're sending to, and this is the amount for the second address you're sending to, uh, this is the Bitcoin address that you're sending money to, and this is the other Bitcoin address. They don't look like normal Bitcoin addresses because they're encoded in hexadecimal and normal Bitcoin addresses are encoded in batch 32, but that's what they look like on the blockchain. This is, this is what a Bitcoin transaction looks like. So you can see there's a lot of different stuff there. I'm not gonna explain it all. You can get Andreas's book if you wanna learn about it all. But the part I wanna focus on is right here. This thing is called the script sig. Actually, it's like the most important part of a Bitcoin transaction, so it's got a bunch of names. It's the script sig, it's the redeem script, it's called the witness stack, and it's called the unlocking script. Every developer has a different name for this thing because it's the most important thing and they all like to give it their own favorite name. But this right here tells you how long it is, which is really important for Bitcoin to know how long it is because Bitcoin doesn't know when a script ends until you tell it, stop. So that tells you how long it is. That number is somewhere around 140 in hexadecimal. Hexadecimal is like binary, but even weirder because there's even more characters. The numbers look weird. This looks like a 48, but it's not because it's hexadecimal and hexadecimal is different from decimal. This one tells you how long this number is. Uh, this is called a signature in Bitcoin, and the signature proves that you are who you say you are. Over here, this number is a barely big, really big number. It's a public key. It is something like 64, 65 characters, and so the 41 over there, it looks like a 41 that's actually 65 in hexadecimal, and it's saying this public key is allowed to spend the money. In an ordinary Bitcoin transaction, you're just, you just have a public key and a signature, and you say, Here's my proof of, that I'm allowed to spend the money, because that's the, that's the public key. I know who's allowed to spend the money, and here's proof that I'm them. Here's my signature proving that I'm this person who's allowed to spend the money. So that's normally how a Bitcoin transaction looks. You just prove uh, you, you, the last thing on the witness stack is always the public key that says this person is allowed to spend the money. If you can't get that right, then you're just screwed. If you can't even know who's supposed to spend the money, you got no chance. But Bitcoin will compare this, it'll, it'll hash this, and it'll compare it with, uh, the, with the previous uh, from address, wherever you're spending the money from. It'll say if the hash of the public key matches the address, then I at least know you know who's allowed to spend the money. You got the first step right. But you can't spend it unless you also have a signature. You can say, here's proof that I'm that person. So that's what a normal Bitcoin transaction looks like. Little known fact, Bitcoin, the, spending money using a signature is not the only way to spend Bitcoin. You can create a Bitcoin address that doesn't have a public key in it, but instead has a program. A, this is what we call Bitcoin script. So this program over here is a completely different program. It's got a much smaller witness stack that's only six bytes. You get really small, hexadecimal is the same as decimal. Uh, so it's only six bytes is how long this program is. And uh, the last thing on the stack is right there. And uh, it's only three bytes long. This is the program. This is the program that we're gonna say, instead of using a signature and a public key, Bitcoin allows you to write a program and say, I want you to run this program. Whoever can run this program correctly gets to spend the money. So just like here, just like in our previous example, um, the last thing on the witness stack determined who is allowed to spend the money. In a Bitcoin script, the last thing on the witness stack is the program, and it determines who's allowed to spend the money, whoever can run this program correctly. What does this program do? Well, I've got, it, it all got messed up. This isn't what it's supposed to look like. Um, but it, this is supposed to tell you what each part does. Uh, the program is 935387. If you break it down into three bytes, uh, one of them is that a byte 93, which somewhere on here it says 93 is add. You're supposed to add two numbers. It wants, to, it wants you to give it two numbers. It's going to add them together. Then we put the number 53 next to it. 53 is 3 in Bitcoin script because it's weird right there. So it's going to say give me two numbers that add to 3. And then the last one, 87, just checks that whatever you gave it is equal to 3. So our program here deposits two numbers onto the stack. This is one and this is two. I know it says 51 and 52, but Bitcoin's weird. In Bitcoin, 51 is one, 52 is two. Uh, and then we say, okay, the next three bytes of the program, that's how Bitcoin knows this is the last thing on the witness stack. That's what we're gonna hash and make sure that they at least know that the program that's supposed to be allowed to spend the money. But then you can't spend it just by knowing the program. You also have to supply the correct inputs. You have to supply like a one and a two, and then it'll check that they add to three. And if you do that, then you're allowed to spend the money. So this is a Bitcoin script, very little used. Most people don't use Bitcoin script. They just use you know, signatures and public keys. But Bitcoin can do this, and this is what we're gonna to use to build our binary circuits and make them work in Bitcoin. Some of the built-in functions of Bitcoin script uh, are listed here. I gave a whole presentation in a different context on all the things that Bitcoin script can do, and this is one slide from that presentation. If you wanna Google it, you can Google super testnet Bitcoin script and learn all about the things it can do. 
Um, but the ones we're going to focus on, the functions that, that we're going to use to make uh, a computer circuit, are these ones, the Boolean functions. Bitcoin has support for all of them. We have AND, we have OR, we have NOT, we have NAND. I showed you those ones earlier. We also have NOR, XOR, and XNOR. And those might not be as familiar to you because they're not used as often. But they're definitely important, and we can use them to build uh, really cool things. We can use them to build complete, complete Boolean circuits. OK, so I'm going to show you how to write one. We're going to use a library called TapScript, which is written by a friend of mine. And we're just going to put one little, one little function in our script. It's going to be a very short program. All it's going to do is use the bool Boolean AND function, built right into Bitcoin. You can just use it. And uh, when we hash this, when we take this script and hash it, we get this address. It's longer than it looks, <laughs> because Bitcoin addresses, when you hash them, they always turn into a 32-byte string, which is longer than a public key uh, hash. So that's what we get. And uh, that's if we send money to that address, and then we want to spend it, what we have to do is we have to create a Bitcoin transaction specifying what address we're spending from. And we have to create the program. We say, here's the, here's the program. It's 9A. That's, the, that's op bool and. We say, if, okay, then Bitcoin will hash that, check if it equals the hash of the, in the address, and say, OK, you at least know what the program is. If you can, make, if you can supply uh, something that makes this program run correctly, I'll let you spend the money. So what do we supply? We supply a 1 and a 1. Because ones, if you supply two ones to a Boolean AND function, like I showed you earlier, that'll make it go through. That'll make the output become a 1. It'll be true. And it'll run correctly. And that's what Bitcoin wants. It wants things to run correctly. So this little program, you can actually run this on Bitcoin and run a Boolean AND function and make uh, a little tiny circuit, just the, the primitive example I showed, where you just got a battery and, a, and an AND gate. You can do that directly on Bitcoin, except your battery is all of us. All the nodes, those are your battery. And if, as long as the network is running, that program will run. So it's amazing, but it's tiny. You can't do much with just a single AND gate. You need more. So there are a few problems with this approach. This was our initial approach to making BitVM was just make a Boolean circuit that has the whole program in it. But there's a problem. First, the witness stack is malleable. When you create a Bitcoin transaction, if you do have a signature in it, your signature doesn't commit to the stuff on the witness stack, so miners can change it. Miners can remove stuff and they change what's on there, and it'll still be valid. Uh, in this case, if they changed like your one to a zero, then it wouldn't be valid. But depending on what you put on there, sometimes it'll still be valid. They can, they can modify it, and that's not good. We need a way to prevent them from modifying what's on the witness stack. The other problem is that for a really big program, you need hundreds of megabytes uh, of these things. I showed you earlier an Intel computer chip has like hundreds of, uh, or millions, I mean, of, of logic gates hooked together. So if you wanted to do that, you'd need hundreds of millions of bytes uh, to put that all in a Bitcoin transaction. We just don't have enough space. Um, Bitcoin transactions can't use more than 400 kilobytes, otherwise miners won't relay them, or miners won't mine them, and nodes won't relay them. The solution, though, is to use hash locks and taproot. Hash locks let us solve the first problem of malleability, and Taproot lets us fix the second problem of not having enough space. So what do we do with Taproot? Let me tell you how Taproot helps. Taproot lets us have one Bitcoin address that has a lot of scripts in it. But you don't see them all, you only see one of them at a time. What you do is you take all of your scripts and you put them in a little tree structure like this. You do this using, you can use the TapScript library I showed you earlier to do this. You put all of your scripts into a tree structure, and every one of your scripts gets a little number, an identifier, a unique identifier that says, this is this one. Uh, each script has an identifier, and normally the spender, you know, Paul in our case, picks which one he wants to use, it picks which one he wants to spend from. But we figured out a way to use hash locks to let Vicky do that instead. Earlier I told you a little bit about hashes. This is where they're going to come into play, and we're going to talk a lot about hashes. We figured out a way to let Vicky pick a script on Paul's behalf, and uh, Paul can only spend, you know, one of these. She can say, I want you to spend number 10. I want you to use that script to spend the money. So this allows us to fix these problems. We can put all of, we can take a whole big program that's millions of logic gates. We can put them all into this tree structure. And what goes on Bitcoin is just the root, just the top, just a single hash of all of them. But when you want to spend, Vicky can say, I want you to use logic gate number 2,356. And Paul can only spend using that one because of hash locks, which we'll get into the next slide. So she gets to pick which one he has to run, and he has to run that one, and he has to reveal, you know, if he doesn't do it in time, she gets the money. But if he's quick, he can say, okay, I put a, I'm gonna put a one in and a one in, and I'm gonna get his, a one out, because it's an AND gate, maybe. And uh, as long as he does it, then you keep, you keep the game going. Uh, she gets to pick another one for him to spend. So, 
I want to tell you how to transfer state with hash locks. Hash locks are amazing, and they let us do so many cool things. I told you earlier about hashes and how you have a parent number and a child number. Uh, so what we do is we have two Bitcoin addresses, and if we want to transfer state, we make the first one say, hey, you've got to show uh, the parent number, which we call pre-images because we're weird and we make up, make up weird names for things. We're going to say you have to show one of these two parent numbers. We've got two hashes, and you've got to show the parent of one of them. And if you show the parent of one of them, then the sats must go to address B. We do that, because that sounds like a covenant, but we do it with pre-signed transactions. We have Vicky and Paul both sign it. That's why Vicky needs to be there, to ensure the money goes to the right place. She can make sure that happens using a signature, as long as she's in the address. Uh, so address B, once the money is in address B, then it says, okay, if you revealed pre-image X, if you re revealed this one, then we're going to drop a zero on the stack, and that'll, be, that'll represent the number zero. If you revealed this one, uh, then we're going to drop a one on the stack. And Vicky, if she happens to learn both, if, you, if Paul contradicted himself and said it was a one and a zero, uh, she can spend as long as she knows both. So this prevents Paul from equivocating or contradicting himself, and it allows us to transfer state from one Bitcoin transaction to another. We can say, okay, as long as you reveal just, just one of these things, uh, we can just keep reusing that pre-image and say, okay, it was a zero over here, it's still a zero over here. And uh, so that allows us to transfer state. That doesn't help us, though, with the part where Vicky needs to, um, uh, needs to pick which address he can run. So I want to show you how we do that. And in order to do that, we have to have a more complicated script. Earlier I showed you a script that's just bool and. This is what it looks like now, <laughs> with, the, with all the hash locks added in. The first one, <coughs> the first hash lock uses the op SHA-256 function to hash a preimage supplied by Vicky, which but, but Paul doesn't know what it is. She has to supply a preimage, and if she does, uh, then that, uh, Paul can put it on the witness stack and say, here's the preimage that allows me to spend using the uh, tap script number 256,000. And uh, so if she does that, if she supplies the right one, or whichever one she supplies, he can spend the money using the one she revealed. So we check that it's equal to this hash. As long as it is, we do equal verify, which means you can keep going. And then he has the hash that Paul picks. So this one, Vicky picks. She picked what the preimage is to this one. And then Paul picks the next one. If he supplies a preimage that he hashes to this value, then we're going to say, okay, th that's the same. So if it's the same, we're going to drop a one on the stack. Otherwise, if he supplies the wrong one, then we check, okay, well, he it, it didn't supply the zero hash so, or preimage. So did his preimage match this one? If it does, then we say, okay, that's the same. So we're going to drop a zero on the stack. He's got a choice. Do you want to put a one? or a zero on the stack. He's got to put one. If he doesn't put either, he can't spend the money. A time lock expires. Vicky can take the money. That's not all, though. This is just, we're just, we're implementing just a not gate here, but we had to add a hash lock for Vicky. We had to add a hash lock for Paul to transfer state from a previous transaction. The next thing we got to do is actually run the not program. The not gate inverts from a zero to a one, or a one to a zero. That's what that's doing. Then we swap it out, and we check his next hash lock. Because he's got one more to go. Even in this just simple little gate, he's just got one more hash lock to go. So we take another hash lock from him, another preimage. We hash it, see if it equals this value. And if it does, then we drop a one in the stack. If it doesn't, we drop a zero on the stack. And then we check that they're equal. So what we did there, we did a not gate. First, we put a, a preimage on the stack that represents a zero or a one. Then we flipped it using the not gate. And then he had to put another preimage on the stack representing a zero or a one. And we check if they're the same. If it matches, great, he ran the program correctly. We can continue the game. We use, use multisig again. Vicky and Paul both allow the money to go to the next uh, Bitcoin address where they continue doing this, this challenge and response thing. If there's an error, if they're not equal, if he put a zero on the stack and then he's, we flipped it to a one, but now he says it's supposed to be a zero, that's wrong. The computer program will not allow that. It'll say no. If they're not equal, Vicky gets to spend the money. After two weeks, she gets, there's a two-week period for him to run it correctly, but if he doesn't run it correctly, she, has to, she gets to take the money after two weeks. So this allows you to hold Paul to his word. If he says, I turned left in Doom, you know, that's going to be a one on the stack. He can't later say, no, 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 I meant I turned right. I, can't, I meant I turned right. He can't change his mind. If he does, that means he ran the program incorrectly. She gets to take his money because she can say, I know both pre-images. I know you revealed a zero and you revealed a one for the same bit. I'm going to take your money. So that's how we do it. I mean, that, that script, uh, it looks kind of long. On Bitcoin, it's not actually that long. It's got a lot of comments in there and stuff that make it look longer. But uh, yeah, it's definitely much more complicated than it looked before. And uh, we can do logic gates with this. Okay, so how do we hook them together? We know how to, I showed you how to make a not gate. 
we can use the same procedure to make any logic gate at all, and then we need to hook them together. We need them to be all hooked together using these tap leads. How do we do that? Well, for every input to the, to the program, we're going to have two uh, potential hashes, two potential uh, bits. It can either be a 0 or a 1 for this wire, and it can be a 0 or a 1 for this wire. So we're going to label the hashes that we're going to put into this program, A and B, C and D. And uh, if he reveals A, we're going to say it's a 0. If he reveals B, we're going to say it's a 1 for this wire. If he reveals C, we're going to say it's a 0 for this wire. If he re reveals D, it's going to be a 1 for this wire. So we hooked those together, and they're going to output hashes that are either E or F. He's, he's going to say, OK, I put, if I put in two ones, this is, I've got to reveal F. Because if I don't reveal F, she gets to take the money, because then the program would be wrong. Um, but yeah, that's what we do. We hook these together by just saying, all right, this A, B, C, D, whatever one he reveals, they're going to contribute to both of these logic gates, and he's got to give the correct result for that thing in order to keep his money, or at least to keep the game going. If he doesn't, you know, she gets the money. How we hook them together to the next one is let's suppose that our program wanted to have an AND gate right after that. We would just use these two hashes that are used as the output of this one. We will use them as the inputs to the next tap leaf. We'll say he has to reveal uh, an E or an F for, for this input, for a G or an H. If he contradicts himself, if he says, yeah, in this one it was a zero, you know, if this, in this one it was a one, but for this one I'm making it a zero, that's running the program wrong. Vicky can take his money because she learned both pre-images. So that allows her to, she's happy if he does that. But he's not. He ran the program wrong and he loses his money. So yeah, I know this all looks kind of complicated, and it is kind of complicated, but the point is we can do it. We can actually build... This program, which doesn't do much, it calculates something and then reverses it, but we can do that in Bitcoin. If we can do that, we can do anything. It's so cool. We can do anything with this. We can transfer state from tap leaf to tap leaf using ones and zeros and hash locks and make really cool programs. Okay, so I want to tell you about response addresses. Whenever Vicky and Paul have a challenge on chain, um, Vicky has to challenge him and say, I think you ran this program incorrectly or this part of the program, so reveal to me what you did. And once he shows her what he did for that part, he has to put the money into a response address. We used, um, uh, what are they called? We used uh, pre-signed transactions for that. Vicky and Paul both sign all of these transactions and they make a chain so that the money keeps going back and forth between their challenge addresses and their response addresses. When the money is in a response address, it has two paths that it can go, or multiple paths, actually. Uh, first of all, if Vicky stops making challenges, if she says, okay, you proved that you ran the program correctly, uh, then she, she, Paul gets the money after a period of time. Uh, if, she, uh, if she can prove that Paul equivocated, if she can say, okay, I, I found two pre-images that you said this output was A here, and then when it was input to the next one, you said it was one instead of zero, if she can prove that, she gets the money. Anytime that Paul equivocates in any response address, she can take the money. Uh, and then the other thing she can do is she can challenge again. She can say, okay, you proved you know, that you ran step 50 correctly, but I still think you might have run step 51 incorrectly so she can send the money to the next one. When she does that, in order to send the money out of a response address, she has to reveal the pre-image to the, to the uh, tap leaf that she wants him to spend with. So if she spends from tap leaf 150, using, unlocking her hash lock for that, that same pre-image that she reveals is the one that Paul needs in order to spend mo the money in tap leaf 150 of his challenge address. So this allows us to have Vicky um, uh, tell Paul which tap leaf she's challenging him on. And then Paul has a limited amount of time to say, all right, here's my proof that I did that one correctly. And if he doesn't do it in time, he's screwed. Uh, so yeah, he's got a limited amount of time to prove that he did that correctly. And then they can just keep going until either she can't prove that he did it wrong or, um, or, he, or she can, and then she gets his, gets his money. Uh, so the last thing about BitVM, the last thing involved in it is something called binary search. And this is the part that I don't, I didn't implement binary search in my implementation. Mine is much stupider than what it needs to be. Um, but we need to implement this thing called binary search in order to make this actually efficient. So uh, by, it's also called bisection. It's, a, it's an efficient way to, challenge, to do a challenge and response game in a context like BitVM. What we do is, let's suppose this is our program. And I just made up this program. I don't know what it does. Um, but let's say that. Paul says, you know, I, I'm putting all zeros into this program as my inputs, and as the output, I'm getting uh, a one. I'm just getting a one as the output. Somehow, Vicky, you know, if, if she runs all those inputs in and she gets a zero, she's got to prove that he made an error somehow, but he didn't reveal what happened over here. He just said, I put this part in, 
I got this, I got a zero, I got a one out, and she's saying, oh, I got a zero, you did something wrong. She has to figure out what part of this thing she's supposed to challenge. So what she does is we start at the end. So we start at the end right here. She's gonna say, all right, show me, I'm gonna reveal the, I'm gonna reveal, uh, the hash lock that guards this tap leaf, so I want you to show me what you put into this uh, function. And he's gonna have to say, all right, I know that it put out a, I say it put out a one at the end. NAND gate only does that if, uh, the, if this is a one and this is a zero. So he's gonna have to say, all right, I put a one in here and a zero in here. And Vicky, she's gonna look at that and she's gonna say, well, that's not what I got. When I ran it through my program, there was a zero here and a zero here, and so it should have been a zero at the end. So since you had a zero here and I had a zero here, we agree on that part, but you had a one here and I had a zero here, so we don't agree on that part. That means I'm gonna challenge this gate next. So she, picks, she gets to sever half the program by just saying, all right, we didn't, we didn't disagree on this part, we disagreed on this part, so I'm gonna just challenge you on this one. This binary search makes it very efficient because she doesn't have to challenge the entire program, she's just challenging the parts where they disagree. And so then he has to prove what he supplied here. So the AND gate, you know, he's gonna have, it's gonna put out a, uh, we said it put out a one here, which means these both have to be a one. So he's gonna have to reveal that. He's gonna say, all right, I put a one in here and a one in here. She's gonna say, all right, uh, I had a zero here. I had a zero here, you had a one, so we disagree on that part, but we agreed on this part, so I'm gonna challenge this gate. Show me what you put in here. And here we're at the top of the program. When he, when he, uh, when he showed his program to her, he already showed uh, what, what pre-images he put in to make, this, to, to make this both zeros. Since he put in both zeros here, this should come out as a zero because exclusive or means they have to be different. So since he says it's a one, but it's actually supposed to be a zero, he can prove that he ran the program incorrectly. She can say, look, you already showed me you put in two zeros here and you showed me that you got a zero out. I can just put those pre-images into Bitcoin. It'll run it and say this is incorrect. And as long as it runs it incorrectly, as I showed you earlier, she's allowed to spend the money. So he ran the program incorrectly. Vicky gets to take his money. This is called binary search because every, at every step we're cutting off another half of the remaining part of the program. It allows us to efficiently in a small number of transactions, it's actually logarithmic, so it's the square root of the total number of gates, uh, you can prove that somebody did, uh, that somebody did it incorrectly. Uh, so for a very short program, you know, there's only like two transactions to do this. But for a long one, you know, it could be like 30 or 40 because you make 30 or 40 squared and you get into the billions and uh, that's, that's where we're at. You know, that's, that's where, wait, is 30 squared a billion? No, it can't be. Hey, you're no math, what's the? Two to the 30th power, yeah, that's what it is. Then you get to a billion. And so if you do that, you can have a whole lot of logic gates, you can have a very complicated circuit, run a full Intel CPU, but you only have to challenge the parts where you disagree. Okay, so that's the presentation. I have some references over here. <coughs> My first reference is Reverse Engineering a Standard Cell by Ken Sheriff. He did this whole cool thing where he took apart a, uh, a Intel computer and, uh, and showed those screenshots I showed you earlier. Go check out his blog for more about that. We got Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. That's where I got the Bitcoin transaction that I showed you, how Bitcoin transactions work and how we actually do have programming in Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin script by the Bitcoin Wiki is a great, uh, if you just search that online, you can find all of the script opcodes that Bitcoin supports and you can learn how to use them. Uh, BitVM Paper by Robin Linus is, you know, he's the one who discovered that you can do this. And then Tapleaf Circuits is my toy implementation, a proof of concept that allows you to do a couple different things with it. So, uh, I've got time for questions, but only in English. Uh, does anyone have, or I think I have time for questions. How much time do I got left? Uh, guys? Oh, I've got three minutes for questions, great. So, uh, or no, it's counting up. Am I already done? Oh, I'm done. Thank you all for your, for your time and attention. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Enjoy the conference.